Rafi. Hey, hey, how's it going? I am doing well, man. How are you? Oh, I'm doing fine, you know, uh, enjoying the new year, fresh start, all that stuff. So you really thought somebody would want to read 310 pages of blah, 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 <laughs> all about trash talk? Oh man! Now you're now you're, you're we're we're just starting and you're already talking trash about yeah. my book. Just trying out methods. Just trying out <laughs> some of the uh, methods, dude. The book the book is fantastic. I loved it. Thank you so much. I I, uh, I really appreciate that. And also, I respect the trash talk because you have to respect it. You know what? You know what's crazy to me is there. There's a part in the book where you talk about the the history of trash talk and like there's there's a part where you mentioned i may be a little out of sequence but where you mentioned like it wasn't that long ago that the term showed up like in the washington post yeah. but then you go back and talk about it's been around like going back to like norse literature in like the 15th and 16th century where like these old ancient norsemen are having essentially modern day uh, rap battles with each other that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And even those, those flighting contests, as they were known, are still, when you think about the long arc of human history, and then along with it, the long arc of trash talk, is relatively new even. Even those, those Norsemen are kind of uh, newcomers <laughs> to, the, uh, to the practice, just as, uh, as our, uh, you know, our heroes on the courts or on the rap battle stages are, because this stuff really goes back as far as human, like for as long as, as humans have been talking, we have been talking trash. You know, this goes back to the Bible. It goes back to the Homeric poems. You can find, you know, uh, invective in the, you know, from ancient Greek poets and in uh, throughout Roman society. Like you can trace human history with trash talk and you can find it everywhere, everywhere across the globe. In every culture, every geography, I mean, this is something that cuts through. It is, it's just, it is part of who we are as human beings, and it's part of how we communicate when we're in competition with one another. And that's kind of the thing that I really hope, you know, comes across is that, like, this isn't some kind of, like, deviant behavior, but this is really, like, how we talk to each other when we're in competition. Rafi, who exactly in the Bible uh, was telling somebody <laughs> that his wife just slid into my DMs? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I you know you know what it's uh, David and Goliath. It was uh, <laughs> we don't have, we don't have the you know it's uh, I, I will cut you you know strike you down and cut off your head, big man. That's kind of the uh, that's the biblical version of of, uh, yeah, of of sliding into your wife's DMs these days and then letting you know about it. You know when we're lining up on opposite sides of the line of scrimmage, but that's what he did. Hey, he was dated him to come to come in range of his shepherd sling. Hey, was it was it just I don't, I don't want to say too easy as as a as a as a cop out, but was it was it did it just make too much sense to start with McGregor and kind of kind of use him as like the starting point and then go backwards and forwards and then slide into different sports and not just sports, politics, right. uh, uh, entertainment. Was he was he just an easy starting point to make your point? Yeah, it's a, and I don't know if it, if it's if it's easy or just simply like inevitable. It was unavoidable in some ways. You know, I, I, you know, I went through obviously like every book. You know, goes through a revision at some point, and McGregor could have just showed up like Muhammad Ali, right? Could show up in almost every single chapter, and as like a perfect you know example of all the various applications of trash talk of you know whether you're you know, talking as a self-promoter to, you know, to build hype, whether you're talking to intimidate, whether you're trying to be a pest, whether you're self-motivating, wh whether you're putting out a kind of, you know, a, 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 mental, a mental challenge of some kind and testing someone's, you know, psychology going into a fight, you know, or even talking about the morality of like how far is too far. It was just, it just became so obvious that those guys in combat sports especially just represent trash talk in its totality right. in a way that like not every single, you know, practitioner, if we want to use that word, you know, of trash talk does. I mean, you could talk about Donald Trump, you know, you could talk about Gary Payton, but even there, it's like, you might not get the full spectrum 
that you would with someone like McGregor. And so that's why, yeah, I thought going into that fight, and this is UFC 264, you know, the trilogy bout against Dustin Poirier, right. you know, with the score tied 1-1, it was just like trash talk was center stage in a way that it like it, it isn't always. And so it just it made too much sense to not start there and then kind of like tee it all up thematically. Yeah, so it's easy, inevitable, unavoidable. It was all those things. And by the way, two things, and I want to come back to Muhammad Ali, but there was something else that you mentioned while you were talking there where, like, when you talk about trash talk, and it's easy to think of, like, McGregor going after Poirier or somebody going after him. But what 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 I think is, is, is it really comes through is all the different facets of some of it is to intimidate, some of it is to is – to, Cause the person doing the trash talking of like, I've said it now I have to back it up. There's something and I get really mad at you in the book and we'll get to it in a second. So don't take off on it where you talk about for athletes, sports are boring. So it just kind of gives them something to spice it up. Oh, I'm so pissed when I read that. But like, it's not just, it's not just to go after someone. In some cases it is and to, to, to kind of mess with their attention. But in some cases it's to motivate themselves. And the the downside may be it over it overstimulates somebody else, but some people do it strictly just to get themselves going. Absolutely, I mean that's you know one of the things that my, you know my, one of my big takeaways from having done this reporting and spending three years you know diving into the depths of trash talk is that if you want to be a good strategic effective trash talker you really have to understand how this stuff actually works. And because there's never really been an exploration of trash talk before this, that, you know, I think we all kind of take it for granted that we just think it's this very superficial top line thing, but there's a whole, you know, psychology at play that, you know, undergirds this. And once you understand all the different ways in which trash talk can work, whether it is to sort of, intimidate or introduce anxiety to someone in a way that's going to overwhelm them or whether it is to try to throw their attention off task or to be, you know, so attention grabbing that you simply, they have no choice but to pay attention to you instead of what they're doing. But motivation, self-motivation is a huge part of it too. And yeah, I won't get too deep into that specific point, but I mean, you can, uh, you know, my, one of my favorite stories that I learned from this book was about Warren Sapp. Yes. And he had what what he referred to as the book of hate, <laughs> which is just like, you know, I don't like I, there needs to be an actual book of hate one day. And it can maybe it's just the collection of these clippings, because that's what this was, is he had his press people every week scouring the national news or local news in, you know, in visiting, you know, opposing team markets, looking for those little things that somebody said about him, you know, that that typical what we would call bulletin board material, but individualized to him, and they would cut it out and they would highlight it. They would highlight the hate, as he said, right, and just so that he could read it and give himself that fuel, you know, to get up for each game. But but self motivation is a huge part of it. Hey, by the way, and obviously Warren Sapp out of the world of of football, the other football player that you talk about in the book. Dude, how messed up was Brian Cox? Oh, man. I mean, so Brian Cox, to, you, so without getting too nerdy, <laughs> dude, there is there's a psychological model called the individual zones of optimal functioning, known as eyes off. And real quickly, what it speaks to is this idea that every single player, every single performer in sports or beyond has like an optimal level of anxiety and arousal that they need to be at their best. And Brian Cox was one of those guys who obviously needed to be at like the very, very high end of this model. And the, but the way that he would do it was creating these elaborate nightmarish fantasies where he would, you know, pretend that like the opposing team had kidnapped his kids or was, uh, you know, sexually abusing his wife or that he was being sold into slavery. And he would literally scream across the line of scrimmage. Like you rape my wife, you kidnap my kids. Like I'm coming for you. (laughs) 
Sir, go ahead and just hit the quarterback. I know. Just go ahead and hit the quarterback. It's cool. (laughs) It's cool. He just was a madman. Who wants to get in that guy's way? And by the way, being a crazy man is one of those things that can work. Muhammad Ali did it against Sonny Liston. By the way, Dini Brown. That was so fascinating to learn where you talk about, like, we think of of Muhammad Ali, the greatest of all time. And like, he was, he was, he was almost like, 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 I don't want to say making fun of, but having fun with people. But all that started with the only way that he thought that he would beat Sonny Liston was he had to be badass crazy and so he went in there and was badass crazy and even even Sonny Liston was like what's wrong with this guy <laughs> like there's something Absolutely. wrong with him but that should, that starts his whole career on that huge upslope that's it that's exactly it there was that whole the year leading up to that fight he talked himself into the ring by just being endlessly antagonistic to Sonny Liston. But going into that fight, nobody thought Ali stood a chance, not not a single member of the media, and probably Liston thought it too. He thought, all right, I'm just going to knock out this loudmouth, you know, the Louisville lip, and just go back on my, you know, go back on my way and fight the next guy. But Ali shows up the morning of their fight spouting like a maniac, talking about how people are going to die from shock (laughs) at ringside. (laughs) Screaming like, I want you, I want you, I want you, Trump. And he's frothing at the mouth. And if you think about it, like, all you got to do is plant that one little seed of doubt. Like, this guy's a little nuts. Like, I mean, we hadn't had the the, the, the Tyson Holyfield yet, but, you know, fight yet. But, like, is this guy going to bite my ear? Like, right. what's going to happen when we're in the ring? And if you're just even, like, slightly hesitant, right, you don't take that shot when you have that momentary opening. You're just a little bit more defensive, less aggressive than you should be. Like in, in elite competition, we're talking about, you know, marginal differences, marginal gains making the difference between winning and losing. And that could be everything. So Ali was playing, he was playing the hype game. He was playing the, the psychology game. He was playing all of it. Right. Well, that's that whole fight, flight or freeze. And you point out in the book, yeah. if you if you look at like track stars where where world records and, 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 and medals are won and lost by hundreds of seconds, if you can get your opponent to freeze for even half of a heartbeat or half the time it takes to snap, you you just want a gold medal. That's exactly right. That's it. I mean, we're talking about the tiniest fractions of a second. You know, we, we say football is a game of inches. You know, with the world records are sent, as you said, by hundreds of a second. So literally anything you can do to just screw up someone's mental game, you know, in track, in track in particular, I, you know, the, the, there used to be this kind of gamesmanship where the folks at the line would, they would kind of false start on purpose, right? They would like, because they're just messing with the people next to them. Right. I believe that, that that's illegal now and you can be disqualified. <laughs> but like, if you can say anything to get into that person's head, if you can make them look at you when they should be looking straight ahead, all of this stuff has serious consequences, competitive consequences on, on the court, on the, you know, on the racetrack anywhere. By the way, you know who else I love that you point out that was just badass crazy? And it did it for a reason, like, like, like to get into the other guys. I had never heard of this guy. I had never heard of the story. Uh, but Shep. I know Me- who you're going to say. Go ahead. Yeah. Shep I Messing. Know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to get. I just like, I'm just literally cracking up at your, <clears throat> at the lead up there because your reaction is my reaction. <laughs> I, I had never heard of Shep Messing. I didn't know the first thing about the 1972, you know, U.S. men's Olympic soccer team. I didn't know anything about this stigma that exists around goalkeepers in soccer in particular, right? This idea that they have to be a little bit nuts, a little right. bit touched, a little bit crazy to play the position. <clears throat> but Shet Messing leveraged that to like the 100th degree and exactly what we're talking about in terms of like trying to get folks to think he's a little nuts a little crazy, and maybe they're going to be a little bit more hesitant, you know, when they, when they, when they're charging into the box on a corner kick. And so he would do stuff like he would wander around aimlessly in the box and then just kind of mumble to himself, like, oh, where am I? What's going on here? <laughs> and, you know, or, or occasionally he would, he would do the, he would like, you know, say, you know, violent things to himself. Like, Oh God, I, you know, I'm 
I'm going to kill somebody. And then and he would turn to an opponent and grab them by the shoulders and look them in the eyes earnestly and say, I'm sorry for anything that I do. I've been off my medication. <laughs> and then, <laughs> you know, you know it's just, he knew he was being nuts. And like, and, but like, if you're, if you're going to look back at me, you're going to do a double take. You're going to think, think twice for even half a second about going for that header. You know, that's, that's the difference between scoring a goal and not. Right. I mean, these, these, these things have huge consequence. I mean, of course, Shep's greatest accomplishment was talking trash to get the U.S. Olympic team into the, into the Olympics. That was, you know, we literally owe trash talk for the reason why our, our U.S. men's team made the Olympics for the first time in the qualifying era. And that's because he, during penalty kicks in a shootout with Ecuador, he went charging out at the, at the kicker, a guy named Mario Castro with his shirt off. <laughs> just swinging this thing over his head. And by the way, this is not like, you know, you think about, you know, David Beckham or, you know, Zinedine Zidane talk about trash talk. Um, you know, this, this guy did not look like an elite athlete. He looked like a member of like a hair rock, you know, like a, a metal band or ACDC or Black Sabbath. And he goes charging at this guy, screaming, gets a yellow card you know, because the ref is like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> then just pats the guy in the back and says, now don't miss. <laughs> and, and sure enough, Castro kicks the ball so far over the crossbar, he doesn't, you know, Shep Messing doesn't even have to move. And that's, you know, we talk about, we talk about scaring the guy stiff, you know, that, which is literally the language that Shep used when he was telling me this story. Like he planted, you know, it, he planted, you know, fear, threat, <laughs> distraction in this guy. And, and another thing he did is a little something called ironic effect. By telling him not to miss, in, a lot, in some ways, if you can plant that idea in someone's head, you're almost guaranteeing that they're going to do the thing that they don't want to do. It's like when you're driving on a street and you see a pothole and you're like, don't hit the pothole, don't hit the po- <laughs> pothole, don't hit the pothole. Oh crap! I hit the pothole. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you know what, uh, 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 Rafi? The other thing is, and 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 you touch on it a little bit, is it? It has to be authentic. And listen, I don't think anybody thought that Shep Messing was going to kill anybody, but there has to be something authentic to it. And I feel like you you went and visited, and in addition to doing interviews and researching and everything, you went to visit some places. And one of the places that you went to was was it um, a Monster Factory in New Jersey for people who wanted to get into the world of wrestling. And I can't remember the person's name, but they would have to stand on whoever the, the person who wanted to be a wrestler was would have to stand on something that you would do like jump, like a, a, a box jump onto. And they would yeah. have to kind yeah. of promote themselves. But the whole thing was is that you couldn't give off douche chills because <laughs> nobody, nobody would buy it and would just go, okay, moron, enough. That's right. I mean, that's the thing. You know, we talk about you know, trying to get people, you know, into a state of over, you know, having to being overwhelmed by anxiety, right, being pushed into fight, flight, or freeze, that's a threat response. But for someone to feel threatened, it has to feel, you have to feel feel authentic in some ways, right? You have to believe that the person is a threat to you in some way or another. And in terms of, you know, this like, you know, selling a wrestling storyline, you know, promoting yourself, cutting a promo, look, of course we know, you know, that this stuff is, uh, you know, is a work. Right. We nobody is under any you know delusions that like wrestling is, quote unquote, real. But that doesn't mean that you can just go up there and say anything. you got to be you got to sell me that story. It's got to right. feel real. And, and one of the things that they a lot of the fo- a lot of the folks in the wrestling world who I spoke to would say to me is you got to find that like seed within yourself. Like, what is that thing within you that you want to bring out? And then how do you dial that up to 11? Like whether you're going to be a baby face and a hero or whether you're going to be the heel and the, you know, and the villain, like what is that aspect of yourself that you can dial up and take to, and take to 11? Because, you know, there was one guy at the monster factory. I walked in, you know, he's like six foot three, obviously spend six hours a day in the gym, just, you know, like, you know, world's strongest man, tatted up everywhere, you know, and, 
very intimidating guy. And he got up there and, and I think he wanted to be a baby face at first, right? Like he was, cause he's a nice guy. Everyone's like, Oh, that's, I, you know, that's, he's the nicest guy here. He'll, you know, he'll, he'll give you the shirt off his back. And so what the, the instructors were trying to work with him on is like, look, man, like you are just, even though you might be a nice guy, that's not what, that's not the part of you we need to take here. <laughs> you know, like nobody's buying that. Right. So like, what are the parts of you that we can dial up to sort of authentically, you know, match this, you know, this impression that you're giving off. I mean, and that's, I mean, that's just reality too. It's not that like you can take any part of you. People have to buy it. If they don't buy it, then you're not, Nobody cares about seeing you fight. Nobody nobody cares about your character. You haven't sold us on it. And by the way, like you know who I bet was really interesting to talk to? And listen, is it as is it as fun as hearing Muhammad Ali going crazy or Gary Payton just trash talking the air to practice trash talking? Yeah. Is that guy the guy who works at Georgetown, Rodney Yip, who talks about uh, how to Gary use Yip, yeah. who uh, talks about how to use trash talk in your own office to your own benefit? I bet that guy's, I mean, again, is it as sexy? No, but I bet it's awesome to sit and talk to him. Yeah, Jeremy. Yip Jeremy, a, Yip, that's right. He's at, yeah, he, he's out of, you know, Georgetown. I think he also has an association with the University of Pennsylvania. But I, I, I loved it. When I found this study that looked at uh, trash talk in the workplace, I just thought it was genius. And I was so excited to talk, you know, to talk to Jeremy because it's, in some ways, it's like this is like the perfect distillation of what trash talk can do, the effects of trash talk, because you're looking at it in the most unexpected of locations, right? And it's and it's <clears throat> the, some, and the findings of his studies I found just to be almost foundational in terms of my own research, right? Because right, what he found was this idea that like <clears throat> when you talk trash it inherently raises the psychological stakes of competition, right? It puts more on the line. You have more to gain and you have more to lose. Like this is literally, this is existential, right? We're endowing a competition with meaning that it might not otherwise have. This is the whole point that this is why wrestlers cut promos, right? Because who cares about seeing a couple of guys in spandex just like knocking each other around a ring? We need to know the story. We need to know why it matters. But also in raising the psychological stakes, you're also putting pressure on that performance, right? And that's the idea then of like, well, who can handle the pressure? Who's going to buckle under the pressure, right? And, and, and who's got something to lose? Who's going to feel like they have more to lose than they can handle? And suddenly they're going to, you know, they're going to be a little bit more hesitant. They're going to go into a threat state. And who's going to respond in the right way? You know, the, the thing, what, you know, the thing one, of the, one of the great things that came out of this study is what they call a failed mental model, right? And this is the idea that the, the people who talk trash within the study, they assumed that the people that they were talking trash to were going to lower their levels of effort. Right. They were going to have lower motivation. But the exact opposite was true. What we can see is when you talk trash to someone, they're going to want to see you lose. They're going to be more motivated to see you lose, and they're going to work harder to make sure that that happens. And so, yeah, from a literal workplace perspective, we can apply trash talk in terms of things like marketing right, and developing rivalry and rivalry relationships. That's how we can sell things, sell stories. You know, it's Wendy's on Twitter. It's you know, the Philadelphia Flyers mascot gritty. These guys are awesome at it. It's it's celebrity feuds and rap beats. It's all this stuff, but also as like, as a literal business leader, you can understand ways to apply this in certain, you know, that you can increase motivation levels. You can create sense of belonging and in-group identity. Like this, this stuff is, is more than just, you know, I don't I hesitate to even say just because all of it I think is, is valuable, but this stuff is more than, than just what we see on TV with like the, you know, the, the house of highlights clips of Gary Payton or, you know, the rock coming back to WWE. You know, this stuff has application in almost every aspect of life. But you know, like I also love, and listen, you run through whether it's Warren Sapp, Gary Payton, Reggie Miller, uh, Larry Bird, who is probably one of the most notorious of, or considered the greatest 
trash talkers of all time. You get Sean Avery, who you talk about in the in in the NHL. Like there's no shortage of people that that you go through. But the the two other things that come out of there that I love is that and you understand why teams have therapists now and psychologists mm. is I love where 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 somebody called Chris Bosch on the basketball court, a mama's boy. That That's it. It stuck with him for four games. He played like crap. <laughs> Oh my God! I'm, yes, that was Kevin Garnett. You literally all he had to say to Chris Bosh is, "You're a mama's boy," and Chris Bosh responds to that by saying to himself, "What does he mean by that?" <laughs> and, it's, and it's literally this idea that we, you know, that one of the one of the ways that trash talk can affect our performance is that it can literally steal our attention by forcing us to try to make sense of the thing that is said. You know, inciv- this is how incivility can get us to act, you know, in regular life, act more impulsively, you know, and and do things that we wouldn't normally do is because our attention is, is, is being directed toward this comment and trying to and trying to reconcile it with within the model of the world that we otherwise usually, you know, recognize around us. One of the best ways, you know, the, to talk, you know, to be an effective trash talker is to be attention grabbing. And there are so many ways to do that. And Kevin Garnett, right, whether he was telling Chris Bosh you're a mama's boy or whether he was allegedly, because he denies it, telling, you know, Carmelo Anthony that his wife tastes like Honey Nut Cheerios, which <laughs> is an implication that <laughs> he slept with his wife. You know, there's, there's so many. You want to be unexpected, right? You want to violate the model of the world that someone is, nor- is used to seeing around them. You want to be weird. You want to say something weird that makes someone go, huh? You know, there's a, this story is not in the book, but there's a, I came across this great story of an amateur high school wrestler who right before a match was about to begin, you know, he's on top of the other guy and he would whisper in his ear. He would say, do you moisturize? You have really soft skin. Like you're just making the guy think about what you're saying. You're not being insulting. You're not being intimidating. You're just being weird. <laughs> you're just you're making someone think. And and thinking is like the the enemy of performance and action, right? Even complimenting someone. If I if I go up to you and say, Hey, you're playing really well today. Like I love the way your shot, you know, looks, you know. And suddenly you're going to say to yourself, yeah, I am playing well. What, what is up with my shot? And you start <laughs> thinking about something that you're not supposed to think about. And you know, I do so- I do like from that, Rafi, yeah. you talk about one thing that athletes do to each other. And then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a real quick story behind it is that, like, whether it's B.J. Armstrong telling a guy during, like, garbage time at the end, like, oh, go get your average – or where it's just like whether or not you still belong or you're still good enough to be in the sport. I'm reading your book over the uh, over the break. I go to a Capitals game. Tom Wilson gets in a fight with this guy who plays for Nashville with the last name uh, McGratton. I'm close enough to the penalty box that I can hear them yelling back and forth to each other. Tom Wilson yells at McGratton, hey, weren't you a first rounder? Are you even doing anything anymore? And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. That is that is brilliant trash talk. I mean, and again, it's like yes, there's a little bit of insult involved, but he's not he's not going after something. He's not going after his wife or family. He's not going after his dead dog, you know, or his drug problem. I'm not saying he has drug problems, but like he's not going after these very sensitive issues. What he's doing, because it's such a smart thing to do, is going after someone's genuine insecurity. Right. The thing you the thing your internal dialogue is already saying to yourself if, or whispering to yourself, can you get it to scream at that person? Right. By making someone second guess whether they have, you know, a role on the team or whether they're going to be cut, whether they belong or not. And something like having a reputation, like being a first rounder, this expectation, right, of living up to this expectation and not doing so. That's an incredibly threatening thing. If you think you have something like a reputation to lose. Right. And so making someone focus on those things that they have to lose is a great way to then push them into a threat state, which is going to affect their performance. And so that's brilliant trash talk. It's so basic, but it's it's brilliant. And it also shows you that trash talk doesn't have to be toxic, right? You don't have to, you, know, you don't have to, you know, say something that's like going to get us, 
talking for a week on, you know, on, on the radio or on, on, you know, on TV debate shows about whether someone crossed the line. Like, this isn't line crossing. This is basic stuff. But it's still because you understand, you know, how these things work, even on an intuitive level, like you can be an effective trash talker. Is there anybody that wouldn't talk to you? Um, I, yeah, the, you know, actually the person who wouldn't talk to me, I mean, there's some people you don't get to and you can just chalk it up to like, yeah, it's hard to get Michael Jordan on the phone. Yeah, but, I'm okay, that I get. <laughs> yeah, but yes, there was a couple of people who would not talk to me. One of whom was Rick Fox, former, you know, uh, basketball player on, you know, championship winning teams. And I heard stories about him as a, as a trash talker. I heard stories about him sort of, you know, being one of those guys along the lines of like a Brian Cox who kind of needed to put on this mask, you know, that, you know, to get into this kind of frenzy, you know, to step into a kind of character, you know, to play at his best. But when I reached out to him, the response I got from his rep, is we don't want to have anything to do with trash talking. And, and I actually put that in the book because I thought it was so interesting, you know, not that Rick Fox didn't want to talk to me, but because I, I think it speaks to this idea or misconception that's existed for decades in this country of what trash talk is and how we too often kind of dismiss it as this, you know, transgressive, unsportsmanlike behavior and that that's deserving of punishment and penalization and needs to be controlled somehow. Right. Whereas what it is, is actually, it's the language of competition. It's existed throughout time and across cultures. And the way we understand it in terms of modern American trash talk is it's grown out of, you know, you know, black tradition, black oral traditions, like the dozens and toasts. And it's, and it's frankly like a kind of racialized stigmatized, you know, response from media and from leagues at large that has made us think that it is anything other than what it is, which is just like how people talk to each other when they're in competition, which David did to Goliath and, you know, and, and they've been doing ever since. Right. No, I'm telling you, like I said, the book is fascinating. I love the book. And like I said, it's great hearing the stories of like famous people, you know, but just the history lesson, like you mentioned, dozens, just the history lessons through the whole thing is unbelievable. Yeah, I and I, I really appreciate you saying that because, you know, one of the things I feel like when, when, when I would tell people, like, I'm writing a book about trash talk or I tell them now I wrote a book about trash talk. They're like, Really? Why? <laughs> you know, like, like, how much is there to say? That's another guy who didn't talk to me. It was Quinn Buckner, the Larry Bird's mentor on the Celtics. He was like, I, he asked me how long I wanted to talk. I was like, I don't know, half an hour. And he said, well, I said we couldn't even talk for 15 minutes. And then he said, um, <laughs> and then decided he didn't even want to try to talk. <laughs> Which is fine. I respect it. He wished me well. I wished him well. But the point is, is that there is so much more to this. And I think it's deserving of our attention because, one, I think we, one, we, by understanding it, I think we'll be less likely to react kind of, you know, in a knee jerk way, in a, in a way that sort of reflects, frankly, like, you know, racist structures that have existed in our country, like right. throughout since its founding. Uh, but also because we need to understand what's really happening beneath the surface. Because trash talk is defined not just by what's said, but how you respond, by what comes next. And if we're going to respond in the right way, whether that's trash talk from a, an opponent or whether it's trash talk from a politician like Donald Trump, like we need to know what's really happening so we can respond in the right way. Trash Talk, the only book about destroying your rivals that isn't total garbage, is out and available now. Hey, Rafi, I appreciate the time, my friend. Thanks so much for having me back. I really appreciate it. Hey, you got it. Thanks, Rafi.